What's the story, morning glory? What's the word, hummingbird? Thank you so much for clicking on my channel and joining me for another review of 90 Day Fiance Before the 90 Days, Season 5, Episode 3, First Date, Second Thoughts. So let's start off with Gino and Jasmine. Gino is curious to see if Jasmine's jealousy and controlling side will get better or worse. Seriously, Gino, you think that um, by the end of your trip, she's going to miraculously turn into a whole nother person with a whole completely different personality? Um, of course, it's going to get worse because she's going to have more at stake. So unless she goes to some deep, intense therapy uh, to figure out why she's so controlling and to let go of her controlling ways, it's probably going to get worse, Gino. It's not going to, there's nothing you can do, Gino, to make this any better. This is how it is. This is a huge red flag for you. And yeah, get your head out of the clouds. It's not going to get any better. It's just going to get worse. So they they go out to eat at a restaurant. Um, Jasmine orders a vegetarian wrap because she is vegan or vegetarian. And he orders a good old American cheeseburger. And while they're eating, um, her phone keeps going off. She keeps getting a notification like someone is sending her a text. And so Gino asks her, you know, who's texting you? Because I see the name Pow. So she literally gets up out of her chair with her phone, walks over to his side of the table, stands behind him and like puts her arms around him so that the phone is in front of him. Her phone is in front of him. And she goes, let me show you exactly what's going on on my phone. And she says, it's my girlfriend, my best friend, or one of her female friends, Pal short for Paulina and she's the one that's texting me and let me open up my text messages so you can see exactly who's been texting me who I've been texting what we're talking about so she opens up her whole text messaging app and um, she says so now you're going to do the same for me so obviously this took him off guard he he opens up his phone and they go through his phone and on his Instagram, someone has sent him a friend request and it was a female. So she tells him, who the hell is this? And why are they sending you a friend request? And he's like, I don't know who this person is. So then he, she tells him, I want you to delete it and block it. So she delete, so he has to delete and block this random person who sent him a friend request. And she was like really serious and intense about this. So once again, Gino, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get a whole lot worse. So they're done eating and the waitress brings them the, the ticket and Gino pays and he also wants to leave a tip. And Jasmine tells him, no, don't leave a tip. And he's like, well, I have to leave a tip. Normally, you know, I would leave a 50 to 20% tip because the service was good. So I'll leave a tip. And Jasmine says, I'm telling you not to leave her a tip. Because in Panama, if you start leaving the wait staff tips, they're going to be expecting it all the time. And your average Panamanian doesn't have enough money to pay a tip. So you're making it actually harder for my people when you're leaving tips because they can't afford to leave tips. So Gino's like, no, I'm going to leave a tip because this was really good service. So then in a split second, Jasmine turns and she's like, so do you have something with the waitress? Are you attracted to the waitress? You like the waitress? Because he's insisting on leaving a tip. I don't know why Gino couldn't just say, okay, I won't leave a tip. Because even in America, a lot of the times, you know, a lot of people in America don't leave tips. Even if the service was spectacular, there's a lot of people who won't leave tips. It wasn't that necessary to leave a tip, especially when you're dealing with a very crazy and psychotic girlfriend. So she, like her personality completely changed. So they leave the restaurant and they go into the elevator and she tells them in the elevator, because now she's giving them the cold shoulder and she's not affectionate. There's no more, uh, who's my gringuito, mi gringuito, all of that is gone. So they're in the elevator and she says, when I tell you to do something, you need to do it. And I was just like, whoa. <laughs> Okay, so they go in the room. She's like very distant. She's not very talkative. She's not very affectionate. Um, she goes into the bathroom and he's fumbling around in the room uh, looking for a charger, tr trying to figure out does he need to take his little blue pills. 
you know, he's just like in a state of confusion. So she comes out of the bathroom and she has on her lingerie, this blue Teddy. And you know what well, she's now she's like flipped again. Okay. Someone switched, uh, someone turned the switch again and now she's back to normal Jasmine. So she says, you know what, we need to get over whatever issues that we had. Um, so the way that I get over things is, you know, I need some love and affection. So, she's ready you know she's ready to do the to, to, to do the damn thing so they're in the bed and they're making out and um he's very like teenager boyish and awkward and goofy and silly and he's giggling you know while they're you know while she's like she's telling him you know I want you to kiss me you know so she wants to get things started she wants to get things rolling and he's just busy like acting really awkward like he's, he's literally acting like like a, a 14 year old teenage boy making out for the first time and I, I didn't get it at all so she tells him to take off his hat and he says no he's not going to take off his hat I don't know what happened after that, but I'm pretty sure it's what neither of them expected, but we'll find out hopefully in the next episode. It was just really awkward and strange. And he's 51 years old and he's acting like a 14 year old kid, you know, with his, with the girl that he has a crush on. I was just like, Gino, you know, what's, what's wrong with you? Let's move on. Kim and Usman. So Kim arrives in Zanzibar. Uh, we come in to find out that she was actually in the military. Um, I don't know if she was a soap. I don't know where she was, but she was in the military. Let's just leave it at that. She was definitely in the military. And she says that she's booked two rooms, one for her, one for Usman, because, you know, they're not at that boyfriend, girlfriend status yet. So they're going to have separate rooms. So the next day she arrived, she's waiting for him at the airport. No, she's on her way to the airport and she had bought roses for him. And all the way to the airport, she asks the taxi driver, do you think it's weird if a woman gives a man roses? And he was like, yeah. So she is waiting for him to arrive. She's really, really nervous. She's like jumping out of her skin. She's so nervous. Usman finally arrives in Zanzibar with his two friends slash business manager. I don't know. They they work for him and they're his friends as well. I don't know if they're his manager and his producer or what they are, but they're like his two friends. So Usman wants to meet Kim alone. Uh, so he tells his two friends, you know, when I go to the airport and when I go look for her, I don't want y'all to be with me. Um, I want to meet her by myself. And in the taxi ride to the airport, they call her one of his, the one that are, they're both really funny guys, but one of them says, uh, yeah, you're going to meet your super fan. And he was like, please don't call her my super fan. Don't, don't call her that. So Usman is on his way to meet Kim. And when they finally do meet, he gives her a hug and he acts really shy and bashful. She's really giggly and hyper. And, you know, she hugs him a whole bunch of times. No kiss. They just hug. And Usman says that she looks way better in person. She looks way better than what he expected. Okay, that really doesn't say much. And then um, Kim was like, I don't look 50. And he says, no, no, you don't look 50 at all. You look like you're about 31 or 32. The lies, the lies you tell Usman, the lies. I'm closer to 31 or 32 than Kim is. And I don't look, there's no way that I could pass for a 31 or a 32 year old. The lies you tell Usman is so sweet. So Usman says um, that she looks about 31 or 32. And while they're in the cab ride to the hotel, the friend, no, no, not in the cab ride yet. They're still at the hotel and the friends come up. So the friends, they meet Kim and that one guy who talked about her being a super fan. The first thing out of his mouth is he calls her a super fan. Um, he says to her, um, I don't know how he how he said it, but he definitely the friend approaches him and says um, that she's a super fan. Something like, oh, you finally get to meet your super fan. And Kim was like, don't call me that. I am not his super fan. Um, I am more than just a fan. And then Usman got on his friend's case for calling Kim a super a super fan. And he was like, yeah, don't call her that. You know, that's very disrespectful. And I already told you don't call her a super fan. So when they're in the cab ride. Um, the friend asks Kim, why did you get so 
offended when I called you a super fan because you are a fan. And she's like, because I'm more than just a fan. You know, I'm like, whatever she said, but I'm more than a fan. So yeah, don't call me a super fan. So then the friend says, like, why are you even here? You know, and she says, well, because he invited me. And the friend's like, oh, he invited you because he told us that you wanted to be here. And then Usman has to interject and say, hey, I invited her. I want her to be here because he knows that um, I'm pretty sure this is like a fine to Usman. I'm pretty sure this is like a financial arrangement. And so he doesn't want his friends to like offend her because she might turn right back around, get on that plane and go back to America with her money bag. So Usman is like very like, like he's trying to really protect her. And so he's like, Hey, 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 you know, I invited her. I wanted her to be here. So he's just trying to make sure that Kim understands that he's still on her good side. So, they arrive at the hotel and they have separate rooms and she tells him that she wants him to come up to her room and she gives him the room number. The room is already decorated, like all romantical with rose petals and the towels that are shaped like two swans kissing on the bed and all kinds of stuff. Just really, really romantic. So he walks into the room and he's looking around and he's like, wow, this is really, really nice. But um, so why is it decorated like this? And she goes, well, it's the honeymoon suite. And he was like, the honeymoon suite, do you know what the honeymoon suite means? And it means like something that you do when you're married. And then she has the audacity to act like she's offended by that. She's like, Oh my God, don't start talking about marriage. I'm not even there yet. I weren't even talking about marriage. I just wanted to have the best room that the hotel had. And this is what they gave me. So once again, he tells Kim that she looks better in person than she does on video chat. But like I said before, that doesn't really mean anything because on video chat, she could have looked like a mangy dog, but then in person, she looks like a groomed dog. Either way, she still looks like a dog. I'm not calling her a dog. I'm just saying that when someone says, oh, you look better in, in real life than you do in person, that really doesn't say much because, you know, he really should have said, wow, I think you're so pretty or I think you're beautiful or you look really nice. But the only th compliment that he can give her is to say you look much better in person than you do on video chat and she could look she could look like a, a whole stinking hot mess on video chat and just looks a little bit more cleaned up in person so then um so they talk about the whole honeymoon suite thing and then uh he says that it's too much because he's not even a boyfriend yet um so because I think she made a joke about you know something about how he needs to spend the night with her or something and she was like you know what I'm not even we're not I'm not even, we're not there yet I'm not even your boyfriend yet so then she tells him well you know in, in case you change your mind and you do want to spend the night with me this is going to be your side and this is going to be my side and then he like was like wait a minute what are you talking about what sides what sides and then he completely freaks out and uh she goes, did I say I was sleeping here? And she's trying to, you know, she's trying to be all jokey jokey, but he's really trying to pull the brakes on any notion, any indication that this is anything more than two homies meeting up. You know, he's really trying to like, anytime she jokes about, you know, the honeymoon suite or him spending the night or him sleeping in the bed, she, he pumps the brakes real quick. Like I, he doesn't want no misunderstanding on what his intentions are and what his expectations are. So then she tells him that she has some presents for him. And I was like, okay, so this is the real Kim now. We're seeing the real Kim, the man-pleasing Kim. So she gives this man, she had bought him a MacBook Pro and a PS5. Someone that she's never met, that she's probably only communicated with him through the comment section of his social media. She bought this man a MacBook Pro and a PS5. And he was just like a little boy on Christmas morning when he was opening up those boxes. It was unbelievable to me. Unbelievable to me. And so then she made some kind of a joke like, well, this is like girlfriend. I should be girlfriend material or this is girlfriend status. And then he says something like, well, you, you're really a potential, 
uh, you really are a potential now. So before when he was calling her a potential, I guess she really wasn't a potential. She was, I don't know what she was just floating around in orbit aimlessly. But then when he saw the gifts, she, he says, well, you're really a potential now. And she's thinking I should be girlfriend status. What are you talking about? Solar potential. But in his mind, she's been promoted to a real potential, um, as opposed to whatever she was before. Now she's a real potential after the gifts. So he actually kisses his PS5 and he tells, and he hugs, like he's like hugging the boxes and kissing the, the gifts that she brought him. Didn't get up to give her a single solitary hug, not a scintilla of a hug, not a notion of a hug, not even like a friendly little church pat, nothing. He just sat there kissing and hugging these inanimate objects so she's standing there and she's like patting him on the shoulder and she's you know just jumping up and down and she's like all excited because you know she's one of those people that I guess she gets pleasure when she sees other people happy like she likes to give pleasure to other people by buying them things or whatever and when she sees how happy they are it makes her feel even happier so she's just like oh giggly and la da 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 and he's like, oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. But I'm so sorry. I'll be going back to my room now. <sighs> TLC, stop exploiting people. This whole scene made Kim look like an entire clown. TLC, stop exploiting I don't even want to say, I don't know what I can say. That's not going to sound offensive. Stop exploiting people who really don't know what the hell is going on. And everyone watching this knows exactly what's happening. But her, everyone watching this is probably screaming at their television set. Stop being an idiot, Kim. Don't be an idiot. TLC, stop exploiting people please so she gives them you know these very expensive gifts and I just hope that when he starts acting up or when she doesn't get what she wants she better not ask for those gifts back a gift is a gift moving on Caleb and Alina so Alina is waiting at the airport. Caleb finally arrives. And when they finally meet, you know, she's really excited. She's really happy. I can't quite gauge how he's feeling or what's going through his mind when he first sees her. And she says, you know, I can't believe that you're real. So then they both take off their masks so that they can actually see each other's faces. And Caleb tells her that she's beautiful and she certainly is. And he says, well, you're a lot smaller than I thought. And Alina says, well, is that weird for you? And he's like, no, it's just different. It's different. And then um, Caleb says in his confessional that he's only seen her from the waist up. And it was really jarring for him to see her um, in real life because she is a lot smaller than what he expected. And so I'm, I kind of wonder if Alina probably misled him um, with exactly like how small she was or, uh, uh, that's what I, I kind of wonder about that because I'm wondering if she only would record her like if they were on video chat she would only show herself from the waist up if she sent him pictures it was only of her from the waist up so that he really had no idea because you know there's people who have little people there's different sizes to them and so maybe he thought that she was more on the taller side of a little person and not quite as short as she was because like it was a lot for him so he said that it was pretty jarring. And then um, uh, he said that in comparison to him, that she was really, really small. And that he says, he also said that he just needed time to adjust uh, to her size. And that once he's adjusted and once he's used to it, you know, the chemistry will fly back. So that told me for it to fly back, it means that the chemistry has left at some point. It was gone. So once I guess he's more accustomed to her, the chemistry will come back. So on the cab ride to the hotel, it was really awkward. It was really silent. You would think that they would have a lot to say to each other. Sometimes I wonder if it's because the cameras are in their faces. You know, they don't act the way they would normally act. And maybe if the cameras were not there, it would they would have been more talkative with each other. But I don't know. But when he was when they were in the cab ride right to the hotel it was like dead silence not much at all and she kept on looking at him I don't know what she was expecting um 
but she would just kind of always like look up at him. I don't know if she thought maybe he would, I, I don't know, but yeah, it was really awkward in the cab ride to the hotel. And then, um, she said in her confessional that for the first time seeing each other in 13 or 14 years, she was a little bit disappointed because there was no affection. There wasn't like this outward show of affection. And that she's hoping that when they get to the hotel, that maybe they could warm up to each other a little bit more. So when they arrive at the hotel, they get out of the cab and he has to take his luggage up the steps because there's steps leading to the front door. And he also has to take um, her wheelchair and also has to help her up the steps. So he was like... He, he was overwhelmed. This was a lot for Caleb. He wasn't expecting all of this. And he even said that, that this was a little bit overwhelming for him. And then, so when they get inside, he realizes that he'll, he has to be more thoughtful to the accommodations that she needs. Because when they get inside the hotel, there's a flight of stairs that he has to take her up, take the luggage up and her, but I think she said the wheelchair could have stayed downstairs. So instead of her struggling up the steps, he just decided to carry her up the steps. So now they're in the room and, um, oh, by the way, she likes being carried. She says she really liked being carried up the stairs. Uh, so they're, now they're in the room and he asks her for a tour and she shows him around the room. And then I think there was like a stool there. It looked like a bar stool. And he asked her, what's this for? And she said that uh, it helps her get in the bed because she can't even reach the bed. And I was thinking to myself, how does the bar stool help her get in the bed? I didn't, I think it was a bar stool. And I didn't see how that helped her get in the bed. And so he picks her up and he plops her on the bed. And so she was like, you know, she liked that too. And so he asked her where Elijah slept the night before. And she said, well, he slept in the bed with me. And he asked her what side of the bed did he sleep in? And she said he slept on that side. So then he pulls down the sheets and he starts like examining the bed really closely on the side that Elijah slept. And I was like, what the hell is he doing? What is he looking for? And she asked him like, what are you looking for? And he said that it was just kind of weird uh, for him to sleep on in a bed that Elijah slept in. Uh, Caleb, my love, sweetheart, baby cakes. Do you know how many people have slept in that bed before you and Elijah? But he, that's what he said. He said that it was weird for him, uh, to sleep in a bed that Elijah slept in. I was like, I didn't, I didn't get that at all. So then Caleb asked, um, if her and Elijah cuddled and she was like, no, we didn't cuddle. And then Caleb said, well, I cuddle with my friends. And she was like, oh, do you kiss them too? And he was like, no, but we, I do cuddle with my friends. And then he demonstrated to her how he cuddled. So he went to go sit next to her and he put his arm around her and she asked him, so when you cuddle with me, is it like you're cuddling a friend? And he says, I didn't come all the way here, you know, across the world for, cause I think we're just friends. And then he says he's tired and he wants to go to sleep. And then Alina, in her confessional, she said that she was very disappointed. She said everything has been building up for 13 years, but all of a sudden he's tired, no affection, no nothing, not even like a, a you know, late night conversation, talking it into the wee hours of the morning because y'all finally get to see each other and you've known each other for so long. Their relationship is a little bit different than the other couples because they actually have known each other for a very long time. So the fact that they've, they're, they're like, they have like a, 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 this relationship, I, I don't want to say friendship because I'm thinking it's probably more, but they have this relationship that's been ongoing for so many years that you would have thought that when they reunited or when they met for the first time, that there would have been a lot more personal interaction between them, but it was like absolutely nothing. So yeah, let's hope that things get better for them the following days, uh, in the days to come. Moving on to Mike and Jimena. So Mike is leaving for his two week trip to Columbia. He brings the ring with him. He made sure that he brought the ring with him because he plans on proposing to her. He says goodbye to his father and his grandfather. And the grandfather thinks it's not a really good idea. And of course, they're very worried about him going to another, to another country by himself. So they give him all kind of advice on, you know, staying safe, so on and so forth. So he lands in Paris. 
Pereira, Colombia. And at first he thought Jimena wasn't going to meet him there because, you know, TLC had made us think that, oh my gosh, she stood him up. But obviously she did meet him there. So before we move on with that, with their reunion, let's go back about a day or so and get to know Jimena more. So Jimena is living with her two boys, nine and three years old. She is a single parent. The father of her oldest son, his name is Juan David. The child's name is Juan David. Uh, his father was just a one night stand. So she has no idea where he is, what's going on with him. Um, the father of her second child is in jail. So I thought that maybe her and this guy had a relationship. The guy ends up going to jail and that she had already had the child. But come to find out, they had a relationship. He did whatever he did. He went to jail, but she was still very much in love with him and still wanted to communicate with him. She would go visit him at the jail and she actually got pregnant while he was incarcerated. Yeah, she got pregnant while he was incarcerated and she gave us too much information on how that happened. But she ends up getting pregnant while he's incarcerated. And I was like, why would you do that? Knowing that he's not going to be coming out anytime soon. How, why would you bring a child into the world with someone who you know he was not going to be there for like a, a good part of their childhood. I don't know exactly how much time he got because the only thing that she told us was that um, he wanted to defend his uncle and acted without thinking. Girl, what did he do? Did he kill somebody, Jimena? Is your baby daddy a murderer? Like what, what did he do? What does that mean that he wanted to defend his uncle and he did something without thinking? That makes me think of murder. So she said that she got pregnant while he was in incarcerated. Okay, fine. She is a manicurist, but because of COVID, you know, I guess the salons had to shut down. She's not making any money. So she's struggling. And she, we go to her apartment, which is a very nice apartment apartment a very very nice apartment it has really cute furniture which Mike bought it has like the latest appliances which Mike bought and she says that um he also gives her money for food and for rent and she says life is hard and Mike is helping her you know making ends meet Mike is basically supporting her and her children like a hundred percent probably so she says that she's not normally attracted to people like Mike, meaning very short, bald men, I guess. She says that she's more interested in big men. She says she's dated police officers, tattoo artists, farmers, and even drug dealers. So she's not physically attracted to him, red flag, but she's attracted to his heart. Girl, you didn't mention his wallet? You're not attracted to his wallet at all? So if he was still short and bald, and didn't have any money, but wanted to be with you, but had no money, but a very good heart, you would still be going through this process and you would still be attracted to him or not even attracted to him because you said you're, you're not, but his heart would be enough to keep you if you had no money, Jimena. Girl, tell us the truth. So her father is very concerned about Mike, the father's worried that she doesn't know him very well, that, you know, he might not be who he seems to be. Um, he might end up hurting her or the children. So the father has every right to be concerned because this guy is practically a stranger. And she tells her father that, you know, she cares for him and she knows that he really cares for her. And then she says that she's got some things about her past that she has yet to tell Mike. So she's got secrets. Really? Who would have thought? Moving on. Ella, this is a new couple, Ella and Johnny. Ella, 29 years old from Idaho Falls. Johnny, 34 years old from China. So when we see Ella, she's dressed up in some type of like a karate gear. And she's in her backyard with a full on sword. And she's practicing all kinds of martial arts move with this dummy in her backyard. And she says she's really into anything Asian. She is very much in love with the Asian culture. And she's also really into cosplay because she gets to embody different characters. And the character that she is when we meet her is a soul reaper. That's what she's playing when we meet Ella. So she calls her home the Purple Kingdom because outside is completely painted in purple. And when we go inside her house, she shows us her anime posters. She has uh, probably about a million... 500 whatever 500,000 dragon statues all over her house and 
she tells us a little bit about herself growing up. She says that she had a really tough childhood because of her weight. She said that she didn't really, um, it was really hard for her uh, to have friends, I guess, and that the kids at school were really mean to her. They made fun of her and that going to school was really dreadful for her. And I really felt bad for her. That really touched my heart. She said that she's been in so many unhealthy relationships because, um, she was with men just because, just because, you know, whoever wanted to date her, it was fine with her because they were giving her attention. So she just dated whoever gave her attention. And this led to her being in some very unhealthy relationships. And, um, she started, uh, looking beyond Idaho. She really couldn't find anybody decent enough for her in Idaho. So she found a website that catered specifically, specifically to, um, American women or white women and Asian men. So that's where she met your boy, Johnny. Okay. She says that she likes the samurai look and, you know, like in the old, um, Kung Fu movies where they would have the samurai, you know, from ancient times, they would have the long hair and the robes. She's really into that look. And she says, Johnny looks like that. So she says that Johnny's 35 years old. He's from China. She says that he has an amazing smile and she says that his eyes are just so perfect. Girl, what do you mean by that? What the hell do you mean by that? This is starting to look a little bit uh, fetishy, but let me reserve that opinion until I get to know them better. So then she says that she can't go to China because the borders are closed due to COVID. So the only thing is for him to apply for a traveler's visa and he will visit her in Idaho. He's expected to arrive in about a month and he's going to stay with her for three months. So she lives on a ranch, a pretty big ranch with a whole bunch of cows um, or cows or bulls, or I don't know, but it's a, a huge piece of property in Idaho. So when he comes to live with her, he's going to have to learn how to be a rancher. And she says that just as much as she's into the Asian culture, he's very much into the Western culture. So this might be a good match. Um, when you think about it in that, in that way. So she's talking to her mom and she tells her mom that Johnny's going to be arriving. And then when he does arrive, she says that he's going to help her lose weight. He's going to be doing a lot of cooking for her because, you know, Asian food is a lot healthier than American food. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of, you know, stir fry, a lot of vegetables, so on and so forth. So she anticipates that she's going to be able to lose a lot of weight once he arrives. Her mother's very worried about her because the mother's worried about, you know, is he just after a green card? Um, is he just using you for money? And and so on and so forth. But she tells, she convinces her mother or she tries to convince her mom that no, he's in it for the good reason, for a good reason. And I believe him. I think he's sincere that he really wants to be with me and that he really has true feelings for me. So, um, she, and then she says that she wants to be engaged by the end of his visit in America. So in three months time, she expects to be engaged. So then we meet her roommate, Sonia, and we meet her friend, Corby. Now they're all going out to eat. And Corby is also, she's an American woman who's also married to an Asian guy from Taiwan. And we find out that Johnny has a five-year-old son. He has full custody of his five-year-old son, whose name is Stoney. And Stoney lives with, I think, his parents or his grandparents. I'm not sure. I think Johnny's parents. The mother basically abandoned the child, and so he was able to get full custody. And what I didn't like, oh, and he sees his son a few times a month. What I didn't like was when her friends were having their own confessional, her roommate, Sonia, said that it was really suspicious. Of, she was really suspicious of Johnny because he's going to be leaving his son for several months. And she says, at least in my culture, you don't leave your child behind in another country to go to another country. Girl, what you mean by that in your culture? Why do you sound so ignorant. Do you know how many Americans abandon their children? They may not be going to another country. They can be there. Have you, I have heard so many stories of people who live right down the street from their kid and will never go see them and haven't seen their child in years. And they live in the same neighborhood, the same town, the same subdivision, the same street right around the corner and will never come visit their child. I have heard stories of people running into their parents and not even recognizing that that's their parent. Your girl, uh, Memphis was on this very same show. Her mother abandoned her and that's right here in your culture, in your country. So why are you suspicious of someone who's going to leave his child with his parents to go visit his girlfriend in America? 
And do you not, do you know whether or not they plan on bringing the son here to live with them? So if you're suspicious through Johnny, um, Sonia, um, I need you to give us another reason of why you're, I, I'd rather you have said, I'm suspicious of him because he might be using my friend. Maybe he's only doing it for a green card. Okay. I would accept that more than you saying, well, in my culture, we just don't leave our children in other countries. Girl, please. That was just, I didn't like that. That read me all the way wrong because every, in every culture, parents are abandoning their children. And what difference does it make if they're leaving you in another country or if they live right down the street from you and they don't see you? The pain of the child is still the same. Not saying that Stoney's in any kind of pain because his father's coming back to him. But I'm just saying that in all cultures, people leave and abandon their children. So, you know, miss me with that. So then um, Ella shares, oh my God, Ella, Lord have mercy. Ella's been doing the most. So she shares with her two friends that she has actually, so she's, I've never been naked on camera before, but I have have been naked in front of Johnny on video chat and her friend Corby was like excuse me what would you say yeah so she says some other things that I'm not going to repeat because this is not what this channel is about but she says some other things to give us an insight on um how intimate they've become through video chat so she hopes that when Johnny sees her, that her weight is not going to be a problem because she dated someone in the past, a guy from India. And she says everything was fine as long as they were dating online. But then as soon as they decided to meet and they met in another country, I forget which country they met in. When they decided to meet in person, she felt like like the guy wouldn't, the Indian guy, her ex-boyfriend, showed no interest in her physically at all whatsoever. And so she thinks it's because of her weight. I kind of doubt that it had anything to do with your weight, but that's a whole nother can of worms so um so she feels like well I hope that when Johnny sees me in person he's not going to be turned off moving on to Memphis and Hamza so Memphis 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 TLC do you specifically when you're doing casting calls for people to be on this show out of all the qualities that y'all are looking for in your cast, cast members, is insecurity like number one on the list? Are you specifically seeking out people who are incredibly dealing with low self-esteem, all kinds of insecurities? I mean, this show is like any psychologist, therapist, psychiatrist, psychotherapist, counselor, they would have a field day with the people on this show. Um, and that's something else that I think TLC should do. There's just people, these people have some serious issues. Y'all should probably think about having counselors as well. Um, talk to them, maybe either like couples counseling or or just individual counseling, because it's really sad to see these people entering these very complicated relationships with children who are suffering from a lot of insecurities. Moving on. So Hamza, she says she wants to be with someone that she and her kids can trust and count on for the rest of her life. Yes. Memphis says that, not Hamza. Memphis says that. So let's go back a couple of days so we get so that we can learn more about Hamza. Hamza is 28 years old. When we first see him, he's in the gym and he's kickboxing. He shows his, he's there with his friend and he's showing fr his friend pictures of Memphis. And the friend is like, wow, she's a really beautiful woman. Um, does she have a sister? Blah, blah, blah. So um, he says that he, Hamza, he says that he prefers plump girls because he finds them very attractive. And and he says that some Tunisians think that American women are sluts who wear clothes that are too revealing and are in, always in a relationship or they have many, many relationships with many different men. But he doesn't want a boring woman. So he seems like, you know, he wants to have a forward thinking, progressive American gal. And he's not going to be like really stuck on her being like a traditional Muslim wife or Muslim girlfriend. So. He lives with his mother and his mother does everything for him. She wakes him up in the morning. She cooks for him. She cleans his room for him. She does his laundry. And he says that when Memphis arrives, he hopes that his mother will teach her how to cook. I'm pretty sure Memphis is looking forward to that. He says that when, um, so then we meet his sister and um, the mother says that she's a little bit kind of concerned about Memphis because the pictures that she has seen of Memphis, 
to us, she's just wearing normal clothes. But I guess to them, for their culture, it was a little bit too revealing. She had on low cut tops, tight clothes, short skirts. So the mother wasn't really feeling that. So the mom is very traditional and tells her son that when she comes, she's going to have her own room and you're going to sleep in the living room. And he tries to tell his mother, hey, you know, we need to forget about all that traditional stuff and let's be more modern. But the mom isn't hearing it. So he said that he lied to his mother. He lied to Hamza and told her that his mom would let them sleep in the same room. But in actuality, that's not going to fly. So the next day he goes to the airport to meet her. Um, Oh, and by the way, Hamza doesn't drive. Uh, He said that when he was taking his driving test, he got into a fight with the instructor and the instructor refused to pass him. You think? So he doesn't drive. So his friend drives him to the airport and he doesn't work either. He says that the economy is really bad in Tunisia. He says that um, his mother has lost her value in society. Basically, society looks down upon her and she can't get a job because she's a divorced woman. And she divorced Hamza's father when Hamza, I think, was 10 years old. So ever since then, they've been struggling. And she can't find a job because she's a divorced woman and they just don't see her for divorced women in their culture. So it's really important for him to go to America because he wants to help his mom and um, he wants to be able to you know provide for his family in Tunisia. So this is like this is where it's like it's, it, the, it's the, that situation where you see where for the foreigner getting married is not really about romance and love and all of that stuff. It's about um, survival. They need to get married to someone who can help them out financially because they need to take care of their family. And that's what they're they're focused on. And so, yeah. So Memphis um, says that she's never felt appreciated. We're back to Memphis now. She says that she's never felt appreciated in past relationships, which resulted in her in her having very low self-esteem. And she worries that when Hamza sees her, uh, she worries if he'll be attracted to her. So you can have low self-esteem for many reasons and it can be beyond physical. So when she said that she's been in bad relationships, which caused her to have low self-esteem, I thought she meant like maybe mentally, emotionally, her esteem is low. Like people who made her feel like she wasn't nothing, that she wasn't, uh, she wasn't valued enough in the relationship as a person, but she's worried about whether or not he's going to think she's cute. So like in your past relationships, Memphis, where people did your past boyfriends talk about your appearance? Because, you know, there's nothing wrong with her physically. Uh, mentally, the jury's still out on that. So when they meet, he gives her flowers. You know, they meet at the airport. They hug and they kiss. You know, your regular reunion. Uh, they're so happy to see each other. And then uh, the producers ask Hamza, how do you feel? Now, Hamza, his English is not very good. So the producers ask him, how do you feel, Hamza? And he says, no problem. It's fine. And the look on Memphis's face was kind of like, what the hell did you just say? As if she wanted him to say something more, like more colorful. She, she wanted him to say something like, oh my God, I'm so happy that she's here. My wife, my queen has arrived. Or I'm thinking that's what she was expecting. So she kind of looked at I'm like, huh? And I'm like, girl, relax, chill. His English is not very good. He's doing the best that he can. Because when the producers asked the question in English, it had to be translated. And then he tried to respond in English. And maybe there was something lost in the translation. So him responding, it's fine, it's good, or no problem. Um, he was doing the best he can, girl, relax, because she liked to like, she was working to fight somebody because she didn't like his answer. Relax, girl. He, he's very happy to see you. And so then Memphis says that because of the language, she realizes that because of their language barrier, it's going to be a lot harder now for them to get to know each other before they get married because she doesn't have a lot of time and she wants to leave a married woman. Hmm. Yeah. So yeah, thank you so much for sticking it out with me for this whole entire 44 minutes. I appreciate you. If you made it this far, I appreciate you and love you more than you'll ever know. And please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And I will definitely talk to you later. Bye.